Welcome to the second edition of the Friendly Neighborhood Spider Pal. This time we're going to be doing Amazing Spider-Man number one. Uh, we start off right away with another classic cover. Um, Spider-Man is trapped with the Fantastic Four around him. And um, I can't even imagine um, in the 60s when this came out what people were thinking, you know, both of these characters relatively new. And um, here they are seemingly in a conflict. What could that be about? You know, you only knew Spider-Man from uh, Amazing Fantasy number 15. He was kind of a jerk there. He learned his lesson supposedly, but we don't know for sure. So um, what we're going to do um, as a new potential format uh, for going forward is I'll go over the story um, relatively quickly, and then I'll go over some of the themes and tropes that I noticed within the story. So um, the story starts off with um, Spider-Man breaking the fourth wall, kind of recounting the story since it's a brand new magazine. Maybe people missed Amazing Fantasy number 15, and uh, they might have seen this one at the store, and it's got some Fantastic Four guys. Let's see what this is about. And... Um, so we learn uh, right away that uh, now that Uncle Ben is dead, there's no money. Uh, Aunt May doesn't work, and Peter Parker's just a high school student. So <coughs> he has to figure out how to make money. So um, Peter Parker, being the smart guy that he is, first thing he does, says, hey, I was making money before wrestling as Spider-Man. So he goes to do that again. Unfortunately, um, the guy tells him that for tax purposes, he needs to write him a check. Uh, unfortunately, he can't write the check out to cash. He writes it out to Spider-Man, and he can't cash it at the bank. Obviously, he hasn't incorporated a Spider-Man or DBA Spider-Man, anything like that. So he's sunk. What's he going to do? Um, to compound things, um, we have the introduction of J. Jonah Jameson and his crusade against Spider-Man as a vigilante, which we'll get to more, a little more in a minute. We also have the introduction to his son, who's a um, test pilot. Um, very grounded in the 60s here you know um he's a test pilot trying to um get america into space um the communists have already um, put sputnik up there and we're trying to get up there so he's a test pilot and um the rest of this story um has to do with um his mission he goes up there um something starts to go wrong in a complete disregard for physics spider-man gets out of the top of a jet that's um, sped up enough to catch up with a, a space capsule. He lashes on with, with his web shooters, and instead of his arms breaking off or his webs just breaking, he's able to attach and save the day. I don't think that would fly in today's comics, but you know they were a little more fantastical back then. No big deal. Uh, unfortunately, J. Jonas Jameson is too proud um, to admit that Spider-Man has saved his son, so um, he blames Spider-Man for staging the whole thing. And, um, of course, uh, Aunt May, who reads um, The Bugle, uh, finds out what a horrible um, guy this Spider-Man is and hates Spider-Man. There's a second short story in here, um, which is about Spider-Man saying, Ah, now I know. I will earn money by joining the Fantastic Four. And uh, in the end, learns that the Fantastic Four uh, is a not-for-profit. However... Uh, I didn't realize this when I first read the story, but that's a bit of a false, um, uh, a bit of a false way to to give Peter Parker bad luck because not for profits still pay the salaries of the people that work there. In other words, Reed, Sue, uh, Johnny, and Ben are not starving. Their not for profit status is means they're just not making extra money, but they should at least be able to pay Spider Man a, a wage that he would be able to use to live on. Um, also uh, interesting in that he tries to join FF in his first issue and um, there was the alternate FF back in the 90s or late 80s and then you know during Hickman's run in the 2000s um, he actually does get to join for a little while uh, while Johnny's gone as part of the Future Foundation and all that stuff and uh, in addition to him trying to join the story introduces one of his longtime villains the chameleon who pretends to be him and tries to steal some um, fighter jet plants to sell to the communists. Um, you know, again, grounding the story in the 60s. Uh, so now we'll kind of take a look at some of the themes and tropes that are um, that are presented here. Uh, sometimes, you know, this might be the first time it's happened in comics, or it might be something that we just realized looking back on it from, you know, 2015. <coughs> so... Uh, one of the things that I found really interesting about 
um, this story and its introduction to J. Jonah Jameson as his um, longtime non-superpowered nemesis is that he campaigns against vigilantism and how horrible that is for society. And um, there, you know, from the 60s till now, um, there have been numerous comics, you know, Watchmen, uh, The Pinnacle, of course, but others here and there, um, talking about vigilantism and is it good among heroes? Is it bad among heroes? What does it really mean? Um, but what's interesting is that within the Marvel Universe, it's kind of just J. Jonah Jameson against Spider-Man all the way until the Civil War, you know, which uh, I didn't read it when it came out, but I'm thinking that's like early 2000s, late 90s. Um, so that's like 30 something years, maybe 40 years where people are like, yeah, sure. Who cares? Superheroes. Of course they're superheroes. It's the Marvel universe. So I think it's interesting that it took so long to become a major story, given that it was right there from the beginning with J. Jonah Jameson. Um, it's also funny that, um, there's some lampshade hanging right away where, um, where Peter Parker says, Hey, wait a minute. How come no one questions the Fantastic Four or Ant-Man? And uh, I guess it's it's just meant to show his his bad luck, but it kind of does underscore like, yeah, you know, vigilantism is a bad thing. You know, why is it only bad because it's him? <coughs> um, another interesting thing that has been explored, uh, you know, in uh, alternate comics and uh, outside of the big two. Uh, although perhaps, you know, I don't know all of history of comics it may have been touched on here and there within Marvel comics, but there's the concept of superheroes making money versus being a nonprofit. You know, um, it's, it's only because the superheroes are meant to be a metaphor for the best humanity can possibly be that they aren't all working for, um, for profit, right? Um, why shouldn't Reed Richards say, Hey, I have this amazing device that'll save lives or do this or do that, or I'll stop the mole man or I'll stop Dr. Doom, but you know, I want some compensation, you know? Um, and of course, you know, uh, any comic that explores that can kind of take a look at, okay, does that set governments against them? Does that end up, um, you know, causing more trouble than if they just accept that they have to do it not as a not-for-profit, but it does really open up a lot of things to think about, you know, why do heroes, uh, work for free? Uh, why would they in a universe where there were superheroes? Um, one of the interesting things here is that the the story with the communists and the test flight and all that stuff, um, even though it does date the story, you know, m making comic book time, you know, a little harder to reconcile, it does continue a Marvel Universe trend uh, started during World War II with Captain America of grounding the stories in reality. So we have their fantastical villains, but we also have the same stuff that everyone has to deal with. So not only does um, Spider-Man have to deal with, um, you know, Mole Man or, well, that's a Fantastic Four villain, but, you know, um, his villains, but like uh, the Vulture and so on, but he also has to deal with communists and all the threats that other Americans have to deal with. Of course, um, a, a large portion of the Fantastic Four Spider-Man story hinges on the fact that he, he gets in, uh, he kind of breaks in, you know, to show how awesome he is. Um, but everyone just starts fighting right away instead of just saying, Hey, what are you doing here? You know, instead of, and that's a trend that, that Marvel and DC and others have, um, run with since, you know, from the beginning of time till now, you know, um, uh, basically don't ask questions. If you're a superhero, just start fighting right away, which is kind of ridiculous. Uh, it would, of course it would eliminate tons of battles that happen in the comics. Um, additionally, uh, we get introduced to the trope of Aunt May hating Spider-Man, which I think is one of the great um, problems that Spidey has to deal with. Um, his his um, not being not having luck with women, you know, that's a good teenager college age story, something people can can really deal with. But I think you know what really hits home with the, you know, his life and how hard his life is, is that his own aunt, the only person he cares about, the only person that loves him and that he loves more than anything else, hates his alter ego, hates the one thing that he does that is the most positive for all of humanity. And um, I love that they set it up right from the beginning. They don't make a big deal of it right away, but, but you, you, it ends the first story. Um, interestingly enough, the first story is divided into part one, part two, part three. 
even though um, there's no all, the only thing in between the stories is an advertisement and I think that's only because back then most comics were a group of short stories not one story that takes up the entire issue like it is today before I get to the last trope I did think it was kind of weird that in the first issue of Spider-Man after they've already established in the first story and in Amazing Fantasy that his story is Peter Parker they call him Peter Palmer, Palmer here must have been an, an issue where they sent this to the printers before they had you know finished figuring out his name or something I don't know um, but the final thing the thing that really hit home as I was reading this issue that I hadn't thought of um, before is that he, when we first meet him in Amazing Fantasy he's living with his aunt and uncle but there's no explanation of why and in this issue because his uncle's dead he's destitute but again no explanation of why um, I wonder back then if people just accepted this just hey here's a new story and they just went on you know like like uh, uh, literary criticism wasn't a big thing maybe Spider-Man was being read mostly by high school and younger I mean I know um, in the 60s there was a lot of college kids reading comics but in general I wonder if anyone thought about it like what has happened in this kid's life that there's no one that can help you know just his aunt and uncle are raising him and once his uncle's dead that's it He's, he's done, you know, um, and n no mention of, you know, we really are starting in media res here, you know, yes, we start at the beginning of learning how he becomes Spider-Man, but in terms of how he got here, what happened to his parents? Why is he being raised by his aunt and uncle? You know, why doesn't he have, you know, grandparents or, or someone else that can help? And, you know, his aunt and uncle are extremely old. At least they're drawn as if they're extremely old. How old were his parents? Were his parents like the baby in the family, you know, like, there's a lot of interesting stuff. What you know? Is this his mom or his dad's family? And if it's his, um, if it's his dad's family or his mom's family, where's the other ones? You know, aunts and uncles. You know, um, it's a very interesting position to start with our main character, and I'm surprised that they don't spend any time on it. I, I would, I'd be curious if I ever get around to reading um, Bendis's Ultimate Spider-Man to see if they spend any time explaining it. Um, I know eventually they'll retcon what happened to his parents at least once or twice um, later on within the series. But I think it's very interesting that they start right away um, without explaining anything. There's just like, yep, he's being raised by his aunt and uncle. Yep, now he's poor. Um, and I just, it, it's just um, thinking on how stories are done today. Just interesting to see that they would do it that way back then. Um, so uh, that's the end of this uh, first episode. Um, and I this seems like a better format than last time where I kind of was, uh, was learning what I was what I was doing although things will still continue to evolve as time goes on um, I love I would love to discuss this um, you know depending on where you see this video um, I prefer um, discussion to be centered on comicpow.com but if you want to leave comments uh, on YouTube this video will eventually be posted to YouTube as well uh, feel free to leave comment comments there as well um, if you're watching this on YouTube um, there should be a link back to Comic Pow. Um, I don't only do video uh, reviews and video criticism. Um, I also do a lot of um, text articles. And if you like the type of, um, the way that I'm taking a look at things as opposed to just doing reviews, um, there's plenty more on the site. Thank you.